I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Precipient, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, innovation in the legal industry, and the impact tech is having on the law. On today's show, we're talking generative AI and the future of legal tech with Zach Abramowitz. He's the founder of Killer Oil Strategies. That's a consultancy that helps law firms and legal departments find and partner with the right technology companies. Today's guest is another repeat offender. We had him on the show way back in 2018 on episode 10. Zach Abramowitz is a keen observer of legal tech and its trends. If you want to keep tabs on what's going on and what's up and coming on tech geared for legal, Zach is a good person to follow. Zach is a reformed big law lawyer. He started his legal career with a big New York law firm where he's working on mergers and acquisitions. From there, he launched his own tech company called Reply All. And now his latest venture is Killer Well Strategies. That's a consultancy he founded that works with law firms and legal departments to find and utilize technology so they can disrupt the way they're doing their legal work. I asked Zach to come back on the show because from his Twitter posts and his recent articles, I quickly learned that he is very excited, and I emphasize very, about recent developments with generative AI, specifically the impact it might have on the legal industry and on legal tech companies. On today's show, he and I talk about what generative AI is and why he thinks it might be the tech that actually does disrupt legal and why he thinks that change might occur quicker than we think. We'll get to generative AI all in good time, but first I wanted to talk to Zach about a parody music video he did that I ran across a couple weeks ago. It pokes fun about legal billing. Come to find out the inspiration for the video was the musical Hamilton and a conversation he had with Jay Um, who's also been a technically legal podcast guest and who's a really sharp analyst in the legal space. I think we were messaging on WhatsApp and I went back to see if I could find the conversation, but I think it was from a previous phone. Like this was from a while back already. And I think it was me who said to her, we ought to recast King George from Hamilton. Right. But instead as a angry lawyer losing a client. (laughs) And I think her comment was, you say the price of my hour is not a price that you're willing to pay. You cry in your e-billing system as you see my bills come by. And like, that's all I needed. Like, I felt like afterwards, the rest of the song, like, almost wrote itself. It was incredible. How long did it take you to actually write the lyrics? It took me, I want to say, two months of writing it off and on, tinkering with it. Like, I would say probably 80 to 85% of it got written almost right away. But then over a two month period, I was essentially looking back at those lyrics every single day and trying to figure out, like, how could this be a little bit better? And then I had to learn how to play it on the piano. So did you play piano prior? Are you musically inclined at all? I do play piano. And I sort of got this idea in my head that, like, you know, I really like playing piano. I wonder if there's a way I can, like, build that into, like, my work stream. Is there any way that I could, like, you know make the piano well, you, you did it. work for me in business. And so I think there was some of that going on. And then like, you know, I, at my core, I'm probably still just like a humanities guy who's who sort of like fell backwards into the legal profession, which is probably like why I didn't kill it as an attorney. <laughs> right. So this like being able to do like Broadway, but for legal tech, that's like right in my comfort zone. You sing well too. Like, please tell me you didn't use autotune. Please tell me that Not you- Not one bit. That, that is my voice. I can guarantee nice. you it's my voice because there are places where I cringe over it a little bit, where I can hear like a little bit of pitchiness in it. No, that's great. So I appreciate that. That makes me happy. No Pro Tools. No Pro there Tools. There was I love zero it. Pro Tool. I'll tell you, here's the extent. I recorded it at my, um, a guy who's like my kid's piano teacher has a studio. We went over. Sounds nice. We went over, recorded it in his studio. He helped me to like hit that high falsetto note, which I have no idea. Like we tried it so many times. Like there's a pretty good blooper, you know, reel on uh, on me trying to hit that note and missing. But yeah, it was it was a, it was an absolute ton of fun to make the song. And what happened was I, I shot the whole video actually in August of 2021. And I was going to release it at ILTA that year. And then I think we were like, it was getting a little bit close. I wasn't sure we were going to get it in time for ILTA. And then I happened to show it to my mother. And, you know, my mother, like a very good, encouraging Jewish mother said, 
isn't that going to like insult all of your clients? <laughs> and somehow, even though the song is about like losing a client, it never occurred to me that this song would lose me clients. Nah. And in fact, I didn't like someone asked me like, Hey, what, what's like the, you know, what's the reason that you're doing this? Like, like it was typical marketing style. Like let's work backwards. Like figure out like what you're trying to accomplish and then see if the video accomplishes that. And I was like, no, that's not any part of this. Right. There's the, the thing I want to accomplish is the video. I kind of don't care, you know, if it does anything for my business. I'm not like, like they're probably like on a LinkedIn campaign. I could probably spend more and get way more bang for my buck. Like this was partly just doing it because like I enjoy it. I enjoy making people laugh. Well, the video is professional, too. I saw you enlisted the help of some friends. How long did that take? What all was involved there? We did all of that in one day of shooting and then a few different rounds of editing afterwards. Yeah. But they are, yeah, they are professional. I've actually done some other stuff with them, and I'm actually doing a number of really big projects. It, the, the one thing that's happened from that video that I didn't expect is there are now legal organizations that are hiring us to produce video for them. Wow, great. Well, let's talk, let's talk about that. When you say them, are you talking about Killer Whale? So there are clients of Killer Whale Strategies that are now engaging us on video projects. You know, nice. one of the services that we've, been, that we've done for multiple firms is help like produce like better pitch decks for their services, better brochures, better leave behinds, case studies, and, we produce a lot of external content. So in a lot of, you know, I, I write long form essays on legal evolution, got an active newsletter. I'm out there on Twitter every day, putting out content. I've got the webinars, but we do a lot of internal content as well. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about Killer Whale. Cause the last time you were on was 2018. I looked it up, it was episode 10. A lot's happened since then. So tell us about Killer Whale. You know what you're doing. I know you're investing in legal tech companies, but you're giving us some info now about the stuff you're doing beyond just giving them money. So Killer Whale Strategies, the mission is to capitalize on disruption in the legal industry, right? And um, the idea behind the name of Killer Whale Strategies is the killer whale is unique amongst animals in that it is constantly adapting its hunting style all over the world, right? So you go to different oceans, you'll find killer whales, and each one of them is hunting food in new and innovative ways that they may not have been doing even just 10 and 15 years ago. They're constantly teaching themselves these new techniques. And if you see in back of me, there's this picture of a killer whale coming on the beach in order to grab a seal like right off the beach. That is a new technique that killer whales have trained themselves to do. And I love that as a symbol of innovation. Human beings need to constantly be reevaluating their own hunting methods like the killer whale plays 95% of its time spent playing. In that picture, there's a seal about to get eaten. So if this is your allegory or your analogy, who's the seal in the legal tech world that's getting eaten? So funny that you say that. Whenever I present to clients or to, at conferences, the first slide that I put out is that picture. And I've got basically an arrow pointing to the killer whale and that says disruptive technology. And an arrow pointing at the seal that says legal industry. <laughs> but what I encourage our clients to do is reverse the roles. Instead of being reactive, be proactive. Instead of like being the, the seal disrupted on the beach, literally use killer whale strategies, right? So I think that's a great analogy for innovation. Now, what do we actually do? What does that mean to help companies capitalize on legal disruption? The very first thing we do is like scouting and research. We are looking always at the most important trends and the most important companies in the space, and we're trying to find them first. That's a very, very big part of our value prop to companies. We then publish quite a bit of content, some of it which is free and available to everyone. We also then do private briefings, you know, a number of AMLAW 100 firms and Fortune 500 legal departments as well as companies in the big four and alternative legal service providers have engaged us basically to come in and brief them throughout the year on really critical topics that they need to be paying attention to. 
as well as like specific companies that they need to be paying attention to, right? So for the law firms, a lot of times it's for them to get a competitive edge. So there's a fair amount of like matchmaking in what we do, but there's also a huge amount of like producing content. And this is what I was referring to before with the video project. We are always producing, as I said before, we've written go-to-market strategies for big four firms, big four firms who wanted to move into legal and wanted to create persuasive content to make the case internally. Here's why we should go after legal. We've helped with that, right? So we've got a fair amount of experience working with different types of companies in the space and helping them to really capitalize on, on the current disruption that's taking place. A third thing that we do is, is sort of, strate- this is like on the strategic, you know, in, in what I would call investment side is we do in- actually invest in companies. I've also done this for other companies. I mean, there's nothing that we do that we don't do for ourselves first. We drink our own Kool-Aid. So like our scouting and research is what informs all of our content and all of our content is what informs our investments. So we have, we try to have skin in the game. We try to back up our opinions with cold, hard cash. I don't have a dedicated fund. The way we invest is we see a company that we like, we will invest in it regardless of who else is involved. If we can then get a top flight venture capital firm or someone really good in our network that we feel has incredible strategic value to invest, then what we will do is then open up a syndicate of other strategic investors who can invest alongside those VCs. Right. So, and here's an example in Term Scout. We met Term Scout. We thought the world of their founder, uh, Otto Hansen, and we ended up investing in the company. Subsequent to that, we went to Otto and said, Hey, we know what are your plans as far as, you know, the rest of your seed round? We've got a couple of firms in our network that we think are really right for it. We spoke to three firms right away, two committed NFX and ground up ventures. And they came in once they did that. And now we have what I would say are professional venture capitalists who are in the deal such that this would now be a difficult deal for the ordinary investor to get into. That's where we open up a syndicate and allow specific legal industry insiders who we think are going to provide real strategic value to the company to come alongside and invest with us. And we do that with, with angel lists. So, Every single one of these things that we do, whether it's the scouting and the matchmaking, the content or the investment, all of them are mutually reinforcing and every one of them builds out our client and our network. So there's really a flywheel effect to to it. My partner likes to describe it as like the Goldman Sachs model of legal, where, you know, you've got a variety of services all around, you know, whether it's trading and market making versus research, a variety of services around this one sort of basic core principle, all of which are mutually reinforcing. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I'm, as you know, I'm a big fan of Term Scout. Otto was on the podcast. It's been a while now, but that's a, that's a good company. But th- that's actually a good segue into what I brought you on to, to talk about. And this is, you know, AI. You've been yeah. very enthusiastic forever about AI, but but specifically and more enthused than prior with Chat GPT and GPT. So the reason I say it's a good segue is because we've got existing legal tech companies, not that Term Scout's doing the AI stuff, but the, the point being that we've got legal tech companies out there who are investing in AI, who are investing in automation for legal tasks, and they're going to have to reckon with some of these advances. But before we get into the nitty gritty of that and what you're seeing, I want you to explain, first of all, generative AI. GPT is generative AI. Just in a nutshell, you, you catch me in, a, in an elevator and I ask you what that is. Tell me what that is. Right. At a very simple level, right? Like the most basic. And by the way, I just did a webinar with my partner, Abshi Shapira, who's at Abshi Shap on Twitter. He's a great follow for understanding a lot of like the technical stuff and, and, at, and at sort of at a, at a basic level, giving you the sort of terms to, to work with. But the way that I understand generative AI is generative AI as it exists in chat GPT, which is the product of open AI, a company founded originally as a nonprofit by Sam Altman, and Elon Musk. Generative AI is artificial intelligence that can actually read 
and at a level that may even be akin to what humans can do, can read and understand text. And because it can read and understand text, it can also then produce coherent, logical text that a human would have a hard time identifying as produced by a computer. It reads in a very human way. The response is what it's generating. Could be text, like you say. It could be a music. It could be an image. But it's, it's taking this human natural language in and spitting something out, generating something. Correct. One of the crazy use cases that I, that I used it for recently was I copied and pasted a PDF into a Google document. And, you know, that's a pain. You have to, like, reformat it. <laughs> so I took the, the, the sort of messed up text and I dropped it in the chat GPT, explained what I had done and said, can you fix this? And immediately it's able to, right? Because it can read, right? And, and, that's, and that's the difference. Up until now, the artificial intelligence, and, and it's true that I've been excited about it, but you're also right that I'm, definitely more enthusiastic about chat GPT than I've been about AI. And I've, I've also been on the side of talking openly about how the AI and legal is falling short. I get a lot of flack for that. A lot of people online don't like that I've said, hey, part of the reason that legal tech adoption is struggling at law firms is not just on the lawyers and their broken incentives, but very often the technology is right. not really good enough to justify learning something new. The AI that we've sort of been used to isn't really reading and understanding an agreement. It's looking for words. It's matching up words together and then deciding because these words sort of exist here that this is a, a flag for a certain kind of clause in an agreement, as an example. Whereas what chat GPT and what GPT-3 are doing is they're actually understanding that document in the way that a human would, right? So if you're asking... How does this work and where, like, you know, why are we only seeing this now? Because GPT-3 has been around. We should draw that distinction, right? GPT is like the underlying, the mechanics of it, the neural network. And the chat GPT, for lack of a better word, just a UI. It's a way that humans can communicate with it easily with a web interface versus just hooking it, your app to it via an API. Exactly. And what chat GPT, what GPT is, is a large language model. And what that means is, it is a, effectively a neural network that has been fed huge amounts of data. And because it has been fed huge amounts of data, it becomes incredible at predicting the next word, right? So this is something that effectively, if you, know, if you think about it, humans do. Like When I'm here speaking to you right now, every word that comes out of my mouth is based on information that I have learned up until now, and you ask me a question, and I just start speaking one word after the next, and my brain knows which word is going to come out next, and I'm very, I'm fast, I'm quick, we're having this conversation here, and it's able to be sort of seamless and, uh, and, and smooth with, you know, regular transitions. That's because, in, in effect, my brain is very quickly predicting the next word in every single sentence. It's kind of a mind bleep to think about this, right? But like, that's, that's kind of what's going on. And that is what this AI is doing right now. It has become expert at predicting the next word. And it's also doing it based on context, right? So if I were to start writing a story about a house in the forest, in the house in the forest lived a big red dog. If later in that same story, I come back to the house in the forest, previous AI models would not have known that there's a red dog living in that house. But if I ask chat GPT, what might I see in this house? One of the things they're going to say is a big bowl of water on the floor because a big red dog lives in that house in the forest. Right. So it's doing it not just based on the last word that it produced, but it's doing it based on the last word that produced and everything that came before it. Like as I am here, again, as I'm here sitting and constructing these sort of oral and verbal paragraphs for you, my brain is behaving in, in that exact same way. So 
I don't know if I made the topic of chat GPT more complicated now or less complicated, but effectively, like the way I think about it is, you know, people use the word neural network. It is a artificial intelligence that has been trained to understand and produce language in the same way that a human knows how to, to learn, understand, and produce language. I think what you're saying is it's giving you more context than just focus on legal tech, what legal tech AI has done. Legal tech AI, if it's contract-based, is searching for things in a contract that it recognizes and kind of going from there. But what you're saying is ChatGPT is coming at it with more context. It's going beyond what you, you just told it. You know, and I, I learned that interestingly too. I remember when we were talking on Twitter, I told you about that site I found, Drakeit, D-R-A-Y-K dot I-T. That was really interesting. And what that does is, I don't know if you used it. For instance, I did one about, I sent one of my dumb one to my kids. I said, make a song about, you know, being a cool dad. And it brought in other stuff. Like, you know, I like, you know, I like to cook and play guitar. And just coincidentally, I do like both those things, but it pulled that in and I didn't tell it that. So I think that's what you're saying it's doing. It's going to the next step. Absolutely. Absolutely. So going to the next step and then in certain cases, and I don't want to use the the word emergent properties because I know that's like a very sci-fi term, but sometimes it knows things that you're just like, how did it right. know that? It's crazy. Going back to this Drake thing, because I just loved it. I spent all of Friday wasting my whole day doing it, but you would put in certain concepts and would pull stuff, even just like pop culture concepts it would bring in. It was it was really crazy what it was doing. Right. And it's crazy also because, you know, chat GPT does not have access to, to the web beyond 2021. Wow. Right. So it feels like there's a lot of information that it should be missing or not current about. But that doesn't really seem to be like the case. Like most of the information that it's giving me seems like spot on and highly current and very, very relevant. And again, it knows answers to questions that you can't even find blog posts on, right? Like, I'll give you an example. I asked ChatGPT because I've got a client. It's a law firm that does quite a bit of work in contract lifecycle management implementation. So I was just curious. I asked ChatGPT, can you make the argument that it makes better sense for a law firm to do a CLM implementation than it would for one of the legacy consultants? And there aren't blog posts on this because there's just, it's just not that big a a market. And, you know, there's not that many firms that are doing it. So this is not like a regular topic where it like had some access to to an old pre 2020 blog post. This is materials that it seems to have learned. When we come back, Zach tells us why he thinks generative AI tools like open AI are poised to make legal work cheaper and why he thinks the change created by this AI may happen quicker than we think. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. Technically Legal is presented by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal and compliance teams with legal operations, corporate compliance, and process automation. We can assist with managed document review, electronic discovery, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and we can also help develop process-driven legal workflows. To learn more, visit percipient.co, percipient.co. Recipient, legal services powered by technology. So as you can tell, Zach is very excited about generative AI. He also thinks that it portends big changes in the legal industry. So let's go back to the legal tech and your angle, how you think it's going to yeah. speed things up and kind of challenge if there is such a thing as status quo yeah. legal tech. But I'm going to, there's some tweets. I went back and looked at a few your tweets since you've been talking about this. And you, you had a couple of them, but I want to read these and I want you to expound on them. One is you say, some of the most expensive legal services are about to become much cheaper. You emphasize much. Another one you tweeted, some of the most lucrative legal work is about to become a lot less profitable. And this is the interesting one. The timeline is going to shock us. Now, I'm going to press you on this one, but tell us about that, why you think all this and why you think that chat GPT and the tech underlying the GPT is going to exponentially speed things up in legal tech. Part of it is that I've, I've seen some of what's coming, right? I can't really say more than that. I've seen a little bit of what's coming down the pike. And because I've seen it all already, 
the timeline's not going to shock me anymore, but I'm still sort of getting over it, right? So that's, that's part of this. Why do I say that some of the most expensive legal work is, good about, is about to get a lot cheaper? And why do I say that some of the most profitable legal work is about to get less lucrative? Someone asked me recently, is this going to mean the death of the billable hour? And I said, no. hell no. <laughs> but, but everyone is like so hell bent on saying that I don't, for some reason, the billable hour just really bothers, bothers people. I don't think that that's going to happen. What I do think could really see a mix up is the associate leverage model, right? I still think a year from now, there will be partners who are getting paid very, very high billable hours, you know, in the sort of $1,500 to $2,000 billable hour range. I think that will continue. However, right now at law firms, the most lucrative work is work where a partner is able to bill out their junior associates. And where that happens most often is in M&A work, in major litigations, and bankruptcies, which actually I know I know less about on the bankruptcy side. But let's stick with, with the first two, with litigation and huge M&A projects. Yes, I think that we're going to see those become specifically a lot less expensive. And here's why. So much of what an attorney does every single day, especially junior attorneys, especially junior attorneys, is they're reading documents, they're analyzing those documents and trying to identify specific issues, and then they resolve those issues or mitigate the risk embedded in those issues by drafting another document, right? So read documents, identify issues in documents, draft next document. All of that right now is what this AI is capable of doing, right? This AI can read documents, it can understand them, it can identify those issues, and then it can subsequently draft the follow-up. I don't disagree with any of that, and I agree that should be, but here's, it's just the skeptic in me, and you know I'm very, very, very pro-tech, and I think it should disrupt, and I, I want it to happen as fast as you think it will. And I hope it does, but I'm just skeptic. There's a couple things right here. Number one is going back to the billable hour. To the extent clients haven't figured out that some of this work shouldn't be done at the associate level at those rates, it's still being done there. And that's a lot of money that law firms are generating and the partners themselves are relying on. So you got to get over that hurdle. But more importantly, let's even say that that hurdle has gotten over. I am still very skeptical that the adoption is going to be that quick. Because let's think about it. I mean, I just saw an article you wrote maybe last year about how contract life cycle management may not be at optimal product market fit yet. We've got attorneys that are still reluctant to even use e-discovery software, even though it's been out for years. So, and this is far beyond e-discovery software where you got to have a person plugging stuff in or contract life cycle management where you got to have a person kind of organizing stuff and keeping it up to date. And by the way, that's a great example. CLM is a great example for two reasons. First of all, let's talk about why it's not as exciting as ChatGPT, right? The product itself doesn't have high adoption because, first of all, you've got to buy it as an organization. You've got to go through that procurement process. It's got a long, long implementation associated with it. That's simply not true of these tools. These tools are more like Google in that respect. I got shamed by a partner in my law firm for not using Google very early on in my career. My first partner review, the partner at Schulte brought me aside and said, hey, listen, one of the, the feedbacks we've gotten is that you're a little bit too quick to go back to the partners with questions. We want you to see if you can answer those questions before you go back to the partner. And he said, listen, why not before asking a, a partner, you know, a, a follow-up question, why not see if you can find the answer on Google? A lot of times it's there. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I just, I changed. But Zach, you can still bill for that Google search, right? This is what I'm getting at. Like 
you're right. You can push something into chat GPT that spits it out a lot quicker than the hour you spent looking at Google and drafting something and getting back to the partner. So you're saying the broken incentive just on its own is going to prevent adoption? I'd say slow it down because I firmly believe, and I see it in my business, clients are coming around and going, why, why are we paying law firm rates for this, for something that probably shouldn't be done in a law firm because they're just not set up to do certain types of work. And it's no offense to law firms. In fact, if you talk to a lot of these associates, they don't want to do this work, right? They don't want to sit there and look at pour over thousands of contracts or, you know, discovery in a matter and spit out a document. I'm saying it's just the incentive to bill and have those billable hours is going to slow it down. But I, I really think even beyond that, it's adoption. I mean, you've got to convince the, per, the powers that be to adopt it. So then let me push back and go back to CLM for a minute, right? CLM at, at sort of at its core is an example of a technology that while the rest of the market has been, you know, very excited about it, it seems to be like the number one piece of technology that legal departments are trying to buy and implement. I've been very slow to get on that bandwagon. And most of my clients I've told, hold off. I don't think we've seen the winner yet. These tools are very hard to implement. There's a high failure yeah. rate. So well, there's lawsuits a, about it's it. It's a great example where I'm not necessarily full throated in accepting that like, hey, these are technologies that every single company ought to have. I can't make that necessarily make that argument about CLM. So I'm not always this enthusiastic. That's a that's a good piece on my track record. But here's what CLM has going for it that ChatGPT has on steroids. The contract lifecycle management tool was not something that was just for legal, right? It's a product that theoretically impacts other parts of the business. Contracts are not just the property of legal. They're usually like legal is the custodian of the contracts in the organization. They want to make sure there's nothing, you know, that's going to put the organization at risk inside the contracts. But contracts are something that the entire business cares about. And because the entire business cares about it, the adoption in legal and the value of the CLM companies was significantly more than it has been with like, you know, if, if you compare it to companies getting their own e-discovery software, for that matter. Usually legal is not buying big, expensive software. Right. Legal departments, they don't even usually have big tech budgets. But this was a tool that you started seeing. And the reason is because the other parts of the business care about contracts. Now, what's the comparison to chat GPT? You can get away with saying, hey, listen, AI can't replicate my job when there's like these very specific siloed legal technology tools that only the legal department has had like marketed to them and only they are aware of, right? You can basically say to, to sales and the other parts of the, uh, of the enterprise, you can say, hey, listen, but our work can't be automated. Our work is special. But when we're all using the same base layer of AI, in this case, chat GPT, and everyone's using it to automate everyone's job, all of a sudden that becomes a much, much more difficult justification, right? It's a lot easier to say, oh, well, there hasn't really been AI that would, that would allow me to do this more efficiently. And it's like, wait a second, my marketing team just produced five sophisticated you know, blog posts in the last 10 minutes. We just created reports. We just have done cons uh, McKinsey style consulting using chat GPT, you're telling me this thing can't draft a, a cease and desist letter that it takes your associate five hours to do it? Why should that be? So I think the social aspect of the fact that we are no longer using specific AIs for legal or specific AIs for sales or for developing code, that grand social acceptance of AI, where right now AI feels like social media did in its earliest stages, or like the iPhone did when it first came out and everyone was getting it, right? How often could a lawyer theoretically be using the same AI as their fourth grade daughter to write, you know, an essay on snakes? The popularity and the acceptance and use by other people just in general inside an organization just in general is interesting. But you said something there I want to probe a little bit. You said something about base layer. 
And even Sam Altman, the guy behind OpenAI, he said that ChatGPT basically gets you 90% of the way there, the base layer of ChatGPT. But what a first-year associate knows and expected to know requires a little more tweaking. So how are we going to get there? Because that's going to be very important for people to trust it, to know that ChatGPT isn't just giving you generic advice, but it's giving you a piece of nuanced advice. It doesn't have to be crazy, sophisticated, Clarence Darrow closing argument type of stuff, but that's important to adoption too, and how are we going to get there? So let's talk about what OpenAI itself is doing. OpenAI has invested in a company called Harvey.ai, which effectively it seems like it's going to do just that. It's going to take the base layer of ChatGPT and fine tune it. In fact, I'm writing a newsletter about this right now. The example that he highlights in that, in that video, it's not like he gave like four or five examples. The example that Sam Altman chose is legal. Right. Now, I happen to have had a conversation years ago with Sam Altman because YC could continue to invest in legal. In fact, there's uh, two partners uh, at uh, YC, John and Carolyn Levy, husband and wife, both former uh, corporate attorneys, I think maybe both at Wilson Sonsini. But I asked him, hey, is YC like investing in legal tech just because like, the Levy's are there and they know this stuff? Or is this a real area of interest for you? And he said, this is a real area of interest for us. So potentially disrupting the legal industry was something that Sam Altman had been thinking about for many years. This isn't necessarily new, but I think it's telling that the example that he gave was legal and specifically was what? The things that a junior attorney might be asked to do in the course of work. So he, he sort of is identifying that leverage model that I was referencing before. They are apparently investing in tools that will be able to take this base layer of knowledge and fine tune it for legal. And if you sort of think about the way that the human mind works, what we're saying is up until now, when AI companies have been developed in the legal space, what we've really been doing is trying to take a baby and put it through law school. And very often, that doesn't necessarily work. And that's where I think the AI has sort of fallen short. And that's why, oh, no, 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 you still need a human behind it. You still need someone looking at it. Because you put a baby in law school. And now what Sam Altman has said is like, no, 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 that's the wrong model. The way that humans actually develop a brain is first we teach a baby how to become a small child and then sort of let them grow up. We put them through elementary school. We teach them a little bit about everything. And then we fine tune the knowledge. That's what I think is happening here. And that's why I think these tools are so powerful is because we're taking AI that knows a little bit about everything and now letting it specialize. So I think what you're saying, though, going back to your point about partners taking what an associate has done, the base level work, and, and then really capitalizing on it. I think in and of itself, you're saying you still need a human to trust but verify this and get it across the goal line. AI can get you most of the way there, but then the person actually has to take this, confirm it, and say, yep, this is how we're gonna how we're gonna proceed in this deal, in this lawsuit, you know, whatever it is. I think that a lot of firms, however, their entire business model, the most lucrative types of work are where they can bill out their associates. You know, law, partners at a law firm usually just lose the firm money. <laughs> right. Because unless they're unless they're lawyers who do a very sort of specific, you know, kind of regulatory work and they're like seen as just the expert in this. And you've got to bring the work to them. They have to be out hunting for business, which takes away a huge amount of their own time where they can work. But they've got to go out and find that business. And then they've got to be able to give it to their associates who, while they make a lot of salary, associates are not a cost for the law firm. Associates are making the law firm money. Right. So that model is really, really lucrative. I think that what we could see, and I do think the timeline will shock us on this, is the idea of having a lot of associate leverage as the only way to have lucrative legal work is going to go away. And I do think you'll start seeing more and more partners who are able to, let's say, manage an entire M&A deal, maybe by themselves with one, seat, with one senior associate but not with 
many, many lawyers working on that deal, you know, kind of pyramid scheme style underneath them, right? So I think that's where you could see immediate change. And how long is it before chat GPT is pointed at a huge group of emails and you ask it, did Sam Bankman fried knowingly commit fraud? <laughs> and it comes back with an answer and see these emails, right? Well, no, it's only, it, it can't give you the answer because it only went up to 2020, right? It doesn't know what happened, right? It's, it can't tell you. <laughs> no, but I mean, in other words, you'll be able to right. give it to point it at certain documents. And you would never have been able to do this before because again, you know, you asked me, what is generative AI? What is a large language model? My answer then was, it's AI that really knows how to read. It really seems to be able to understand language. If you're just searching for words, that doesn't work. You can't just, you, you can't send a, an associate. <laughs> you're not, you're, even, even when an associate is, is looking at a contract and looking for specific words, they know so much else that they're not really just looking for a word. Once an AI knows how to read and understand documents, it's really a game changer. That's an interesting point too. Um, Dan Katz and Michael Bonarito were just on Bob Ambrogi's Law Next podcast. They're a really interesting episode. I encourage people to listen to it. But what they did is they fed GPT. I think they built their own app to do it and use the API, but they used GPT to take a bar exam and it passed. I mean, not great, but it did pass. But one of the things they pointed out, and I think this is very interesting, it goes to our discussion right here where this is need to train beyond the base level is that legal ease in and of itself, the way contracts are written and the way lawyers talk in documents is a little different than common language, like including, but not limited to like, we don't say that in our conversation, but we might put it in a contract. So I think that's the kind of training to get where you want it to be is, that's needed. Right. Well, listen, I, I don't even know that it's something like you said that, that I want it to be. I don't know that I'm necessarily rooting for AI. <laughs> I'm and and I'm seriously like I I don't there, there's a part of this that's, that's quite scary and there's a huge unknown out there and I do think that people are somewhat un, uncomfortable with that and, and you can definitely see that those discussions are beginning to take place. You know, Sam Altman has said they're already working on research related to universal basic income. I mean, these are frightening conversations and it's, it's a huge unknown. But what I think is happening right now, and this goes back to the cultural adoption, is we've never seen this wide an adoption of AI in our society where we're beginning to trust. We're beginning to trust the AI to get a lot of things yeah. right. And I think that's, that's what's different right now. So I don't think people are ready to do an M&A deal without a big firm or without a big attorney on it, but they might be willing to say, okay, I'm, I'm hiring this partner. I'm not hiring this partner and their team. And as a result, you could see, I mean, I, I think you could start seeing lawyers, big M&A attorneys or big litigators go out on their own or form their own boutiques because they're not necessarily going to need the entire massive infrastructure of a firm. I think that's that's what's going to get like shaken up in all of this. I don't think people are yet ready to go through a major litigation, you know, with with an AI whispering into the AirPods in their right. ear. Right. That I that I don't think is the case. But that level right beneath it, I think we might be at a point where we're ready to to do that kind of work or to have that work done for us. By the way, just one other point, because I, I've had very serious conversations with every company that we've invested in, because and I said this, this is a different tweet. I think that what could get disrupted before the lawyers themselves is legal technology. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. It's very interesting. This, I mean, if you are a company that has spent a ton of time on building your own AI you may have just spent money on something, I mean, by no fault of your own, that now you really don't need. Maybe there's a way, I'm sure there's a way where, you know, let's talk about Kira or Zoov or what have you. They can like integrate it and that could be, you know, on top of that base layer, that's the training. That's that first level associate training. So, okay, true. But as an investor, 
I'm looking at these kinds of companies right now, and I'm not sure that any are investable because the barrier to entry is so low. And that's a good thing, right? In other words, I want lots of companies in, in this space. I want that, by the way, that's why every, like a lot of these companies are having people sign NDAs right now. Why sign yeah. an, what, what, what do you need an NDA for? No, but there's a real reason. The reason you want to have an NDA is because the barrier to entry of taking these tools and fine tuning them is very, very low. You're talking about six month moats, not, you know, six year moats. That's really a big deal. And I think, listen, my prediction is within a year, we're going to see some really, really big legal tech companies, big ones, go out of business because they've become effectively legacy and redundant. Yeah, interesting. Fun time. Thanks for coming on the show. As always, Zach, good conversation. I will put in the show notes on the episode page at tlpodcast.com links to your video, links to your Twitter account. Tell people where to go to read your newsletters and learn more about Killer Whale. Sure. So you can go to www.legallydisrupted.com. That's our newsletter. You can subscribe there. My website, which is mostly a placeholder of a website, we like to keep everything very mysterious <laughs> at Killer Whale Strategies, but it's killerwhalestrategies.com. You can follow me at Zach Abramowitz on Twitter. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.